doing today? Good, man. Just, you know, rainy day in New York, whatever. Well, you're about to get a lot of uh, sunshine and heat in Austin when you get here. So, But it's welcome. all good. Whether it's rain, whether it's snow, whether I'm fucking healthy. How about that? <laughs> Something to be I, said for it. that. I don't, I don't complain anymore. People go, it's raining. I go, yeah, it does. It happens. It's hot. Yep. Okay. Hey. It's like, you know, <laughs> I just always think there's people who can't even come outside, can't walk, can't, you know, I just. All you got to do is watch a thing about little kids with cancer and you don't, you shut your mouth. That's real. I'm, I mean, it was not corny, but I was watching this thing. I just caught up with this thing. Five, six year olds with cancer, better attitudes than people that I know that are old, healthy, complaining about. I was like, I am done talking shit. I'm done. No, none of that anymore. Done. I'm like, enjoy that. You know? So, oh, it, it puts yeah. things in perspective really quickly. Woo. Big time. I go, gotcha. I was like, you know, sometimes you just need that to to to, to reset your mentality. Say, hey, enough complaining. Stop. Like, cut it out. <laughs> well, this is a world you know? where it's almost, this is a world now where it's almost like you're rewarded for complaining too. And look, I, it's, ho- it's, it's, I host a radio it's, show it's, and I, I complain about things from time to time, but I'm doing it for comedic effect, as do you on stage, I'm guessing as well. But when it boils well, yeah, down yeah, to it, was- is it that big of a deal? People go, you get tired of traveling? I go, no. <laughs> I get tired because I'm a human being. I, you know, I got to go to sleep. I get tired, but tired of like just, I'm just tired of traveling, doing what I, doing what I love. No, what? No. I'd be like, do you get tired of sitting in the same spot in the same city at the same desk? Do you get tired of that? Is what I want to know. Cause me leaving. And going where I want to, I go to a different city, whether it's a city that's not as great as another city, but I get to leave and and <laughs> what? And, you know, as when you were a kid, you always wanted to stay out late. You always wanted to leave. And now you're big and you can leave. Why would I be tired of it? I've got a nine and seven year old at home and the nine year old, especially she is too smart for her own good. I mean, she is, we haven't gotten her IQ tested, probably genius level IQ, Oh, wow. She is champing at the bit to be a grown up. I'm like, you don't understand. Not to say that you have to complain about everything, but please just enjoy your childhood while you can. You don't get this back. You what you think are big problems, look, they're your problems and they certainly matter, but they pale in comparison to what you're going to be dealing with in a decade. My God, you ain't lying. And you know you're trying to set it up for them to be problem free, you know? <laughs> your best. Quite the opposite. That's that's mom's job. I'm as dad. I'm I'm trying to set them up to deal with some difficulties because if we're doing it right, I think Godfrey, in terms of talking about family, every generation has it a little bit easier than the previous. But What's by the that, same token, you be. create a softness when you do that. When all of a sudden these little humans aren't having to do things for themselves anymore, you know. And it's like what you say, I guess, I don't know how you run your family, but you guys make sure you implement that. Hey, listen, learn to work for stuff too. Also learn that you keep, it's about a family balance, like teaching them, listen, you treat people like this, no such thing as condescension. We don't treat people like they're nobodies. Everybody, you know, works hard. It does, you know, you, it, I'm sure you're doing the right thing. You know, It's all about what they teach the kids, man. You have to do it early too. Oh, I screw up royally at times as well, and that's where I have to yeah. be able. I have to be big enough to apologize and admit that uh, yeah. I know you look at me as a parent, as somebody who's infallible. Nobody's perfect, so I've got to apologize yeah. to you here because I screwed something up. Yeah, 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 and then the respect has to come into it too. You know, you, that you're their father. You're like, no, I'm your father. Fuck that. Like, <laughs> like my father used to tell me that we're not friends. But I love you, but we're not friends. We're not, don't make me the equal. Like, then that's where the disrespect comes from. I'm your father. And and I and I always, even my parents, but I, there was a different language that I spoke to my parents. It was different. I, when I was with my friends, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then, you know, when you get a teen, you become a teenager, you get a little rebellious. My father said, don't talk to me like you're, you're, I'm your friend. Those are your friends outside. You don't, I'm your, and I, and I always loved that. When I look back, I go, I'm glad he did that. Rank and file, man, you know? <laughs> It's like in, in comedy, if you're an opener, you don't talk to the headliner crazy. You show me some respect, but I don't even, I don't put you down either. But because I was in your position, but you, there has to be a rank and file, man. 
Oh, the uh, Asian culture and how much respect they put on their elders. Oh my! Yeah. It's just, it's still instilled. It's like even even like you look at the like my I'm with my Korean friends when they see an elder, they bow and they if 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 they greet that there's a certain greeting. Like if I say I'm gonna say oh and I'm say bye, but if they're talking to an elder person, there's a different way they say it. Mm-hmm. There's a different way. There's a bow and a, it's an older person. They say it, it and I I love that. You know, me being Nigerian, there's a lot of that too. Elders, you talk to your elders a certain way. That should be period across the board. You know, for people who live longer than you, who've shown you respect, I think it should just be like that. And I like that. So rank and file. I think even when I'm watching the Olympics, I'm Olympic up, man. I love the Olympics. So I'm watching the Chinese, the diving, which I love. They're, they don't splash, bro. <laughs> It's the lack of body hair. <laughs> lack of body hair, lack of body. Yeah, that, that too. <laughs> you literally have to be like this. Yeah. You know, in America, we we belly flop because we got asses. And <laughs> but when they finish their dive, they bow to the to their audience. Yeah. After they get out, they and I just love all that little respect stuff. I just like that, you know. So uh, your former Soul Plane co-star uh, Snoop Dogg is one of the big stars Killing of this year's Killing Olympics. How hilarious is it to watch him just travel around Paris rooting for all these different Be- American teams? Because he's, I know Snoop Dogg for a long time. And he's an actual friend of mine. And I, I, and I not too long ago, maybe a year and a half ago to you, I was at his the, 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 the dog pound. He was doing a, he was doing a show where he watches videos and he brings in comedians. So we did that. And I did his podcast recently. And he's just, he just the, uh, he's just the definition of what cool is, man. Yeah. He's just, he's just cool. He's like, he's at the level of the Stan Lee, the Bruce Lee, the, uh, you know what I mean? The Michael Jordan, the just icons that you just want to be in the same room with. Like, you know, and he's really in a, a nice guy though. Like, that's what you see. He's cool, man. It's like he's never mean. He's never, you know, it's he's just a good dude, man. Like when I first met him doing Soul Plane, first of all, first of all, I almost didn't audition for that dumbass movie, but I found out he was attached to it. And that's what brought me to the audition. I said, if I can get in this movie and be next side by side with Snoop Dogg, do you know how cool that'll be? Oh, man. And so he just always was that guy, just cool dude. I remember when we were talking about where we're shooting and we're waiting in between scenes and we were talking about Scooby-Doo. Like when we woke up and he like, he'd be like, remember Scooby-Doo? He, man, it's like, it was always the same dude. If it wasn't for you meddling kids, I would have got away with that. You know, <laughs> To talk with Snoop Dogg about Scooby-Doo on Saturday morning cartoons. Come on, bro. Like, so he's in that. He's an iconic figure in American. He's an international figure. Yeah. He's getting like 500 grand, uh, you know, uh, I think a day. He's getting 500 grand a day. But it's like he's 20 something, almost 30 years in hip hop. He's the definition of what hip hop is West Coast hip hop. Just such a, a talented dude. And just even, even, even him as a, a, a gangbanger. But still, he was he he made it to where he it's like he crossed over, like you know what I mean. He he goes, yeah, I, I was I'm a crip, but I'm not. We're human beings too. Like he just made he's brought everything humanity to everything to me. You know so, what I'm saying? Yeah, it's so interesting to see people who gain this sort of universal respect and appeal, like. Johnny Cash is an example. Bill Murray's Johnny got some Ka- of that too. Keanu yeah, Reeves. Yeah, I talked yeah, to Ice Cube yeah. last week. Ice Cube's on that list too. There's just cer- certain dudes all that if you don't like them, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, and they're all game changers. Ice yeah. Cube was a game changer in music with NWA. Of course, there were some things that were negative and some things that were positive. Just mm-hmm. changing the way hip hop went to with gangster rap and but all of us saw his movies like Fridays and. Are we there yet as a producer, filmmaker? Now he has the three-on-three basketball, which is in the Olympics. I mean, the guy is like, it was all game changers, all people that kind of move society in different ways. You know, that's those are the people I respect, you know. 
I want to be one of those. <laughs> I'm going to uh, pause for just a second. I forgot to hit record on video. The audio has been recording this entire time, so all is not lost, but I'm going to start the uh, the video. Recording. Oh, you want to start over? Recording in no, no, progress. No, no, we're, no, we're not, we're not starting over. Are you kidding me? This has been <laughs> exactly what I was hoping for out of this conversation, Godfrey, from beginning to now to the end. And that's because I first recognized just how hilarious you were from, I think it was a premium <laughs> blend show on Comedy oh. Central back in the late 90s, early 2000s. You know and what I wish? I wish I wish Comedy Central got back to being funny. I, what what I happened there? Really, because because they, at some point, know. something other than being funny started to run that place. Um, it's it's kind of spread all over the place. Like this, not being funny and just being okay. I don't know because it's like if sports, if sports like got really soft, like. It's almost impossible to, to to slack off in sports, in pro baseball, pro basketball. You really got – I don't think basket, pro basketball is as aggressive as it used to be, but you still got to be damn good. You know, you still got to be really good. You still got to hit your shot. You still got to play deep. And, and I just wish it was taken that way, that seriously, because comedy is so difficult. <laughs> And and it's difficult, and it's almost it's almost like they're saying, "Well, we want to make it not as difficult by giving these people shows and specials that aren't ready, that aren't." It's a lot of it's a wasteland out there. I think, you know, I think that, and this is not me, and this is me speaking for people who I know are talented as all hell, and no, and they don't have a special. They're not on this. They're not on that. And I go. Because somebody has a following, which I get as a business perspective, I get it. But talent always wins. People yeah. want to come back to see good stuff. You know, that's like me selling a brand of donuts, and they and I I I have all these followers. I've been pro, I've been talking about it online, and then they eat it, and everybody gets sick from it because it's 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 full of toxic shit. It's like, oh, why did we come for this? What was this? I thought it was real. You know, you know what I'm saying? And then there's someone that makes amazing donuts that nobody knows about and no one will buy their product and their shit is all natural. It's perfect. And it's, I know it's a marketing thing, but comedy is like, you can't cheat it. No. I just, you just can't cheat it, man. I know what I'm talking about because as a funny guy, which I think I'm a funny guy, oh, yeah. I work at it all the time in the middle of the week. I'm on stage a few times before I even come to Austin. Yeah. I'm on stage. I'm on stage tonight. I work on it because I, I have this thing that comedy is always chasing me. Like you will go to get, get a practice. Oh, don't let me get you. Don't let me get, that's always in the back of my head. I have to be sharp. I have to be on it. You know, you talked about at the start of this conversation, how seeing a kid with cancer is the great reality check. Comedy is yeah. the great equalizer for funny people. Cause you can watch somebody who's known as a world-class comedian, but if they're starting to work on a new hour, they're not necessarily going to get laughs. And there are people there specifically to laugh at and with them. And my favorite example to think about with this is Dave Chappelle. Yes. Uh, when COVID was uh, still very much a thing, more of a thing in some places than others, I guess I lucked out a little bit being in Austin and Texas yeah. because uh, Chappelle and Rogan were doing those outdoor shows. And yes. I watched Chappelle really start to work on the special that uh, had the ode to his trans friend at the very end that uh, some people tried to cancel him for. And it was pretty raw in the beginning. And there there were moments yep. that weren't all that funny that when I watched the special later on, I'm like, oh, it's fascinating how he took this turn you, here. You saw the building. And that's the one thing I give credit to Chappelle. I've known him for a long time. He's always on stage. He yeah. loves the stage. And this is an example Chappelle does not take comedy for granted. He's always on stage. He'll be on stage for hours half the time. Yeah. And and you'd be like, yo, get off, man. <laughs> but he's a master at what he does. And it's real. Chris Rock will come in when he wants to work on stuff, really technically work on his shit. Have a notebook on the stage, look, work on it. From 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 Louis C.K. to 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 um, I mean, everybody from Ju uh, even Judy Gold. Judy Cole will come in, I, who I think is one of the funniest human beings out there. She still works on it. We, it's, it's a real craft. Seinfeld still comes around and, and does his thing. He's a billionaire, but it's comedy is always that thing. Like, don't, don't mess it up. Don't, it's, it's like you're, it's always chasing you. It's a real art. If Seinfeld is working on new shit, 
guess what, buddy? Yeah, how are you getting how are you getting an hour and you only have five minutes? And I have to watch. And one day I just said, let me watch, let me watch some comedy specials just for shits and giggles. There was shit, but there were no giggles. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And for the people and for the people that were there, for the people that I know are good, their specials, I was like, yeah, that's what I expected. But so, and and don't get me wrong, like premium blend, like shows like premium blend. That when I got on there, I was um maybe four or five years in, five, six years. So mm. I had seven minutes. I had seven minutes. Yeah. And that's all I deserved. Seven. Boom. That's it. But it was a good you know seven I mean? minutes too. It was a good seven, but it was ready. They saw it. They knew what I was doing. I had worked it out. And plus I'm in New York, so I'm doing yeah. 30 to 40 shows a week. So my seven minutes was boom, 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 boom. You know, and that's just, I just feel like that's what's fair. When I see, in, in, you know, even in Austin and you see just comics that go up all the time and work it and work it, you go, those are the people you need to be picking that are constantly killing. And, co and remember, not comedy is subjective. Yes, you're right. But beauty is too. But you know who's attractive though. You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. I can say yeah. there's Beyonce, there's there's Gwen Stefani, there's a, they're all I don't like them all. Like if I you know they're not all my type, but they're all like attractive. Like yeah, Gwen Stefani's attractive, Beyonce's attractive, Janelle Monae's attractive. This person, yeah, they're attractive, but doesn't mean I want them. But they're attractive. You understand? So that's like comedy. I go, I get why they like this comic. That might not be my style, but I understand why they like that person he or she is pretty damn good at what they do. But people want to make excuse for terrible, terrible comedians and going, it's just comedy subjective. I go, stop. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like, and I wish it was, I, I consider it a sport. If you suck, you should be riding the bench. Yeah. Or get traded but, to another team. <laughs> but it's weird too, though, because of social media, which you talked about a little bit earlier, it's created stand-up stars out of people who don't necessarily have business being on stage. <laughs> uh, you, you've seen that too, right? Like, I'm not yeah. crazy in, in watching people that yeah. are headlining at big clubs Ooh. in this town that I'm like, what the hell is going on here? This person's been doing stand-up for like two or three years at most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and listen, and as a, as a um, which I've learned, when I worked for Cosby, when Cosby was just Cosby, he had told me, I remember I was in his office, we're talking and shit, comedy stuff. And he just goes, he says, when you see the word, he goes, when you see the word show business, what do you see? And I was like, uh, I'm talking, he's talking like Cosby with his cigar. He's like, what do you see when you see show and business? What is the bigger word? I was like, business. He goes, always remember that shit. And I see if I owned a club and I have sock puppet Pete, uh, who's got uh, <laughs> he, he has he has 10 million followers and he sold out six shows and I, he sold out tickets in, and everybody comes with a sock on their hand and they're like oh, we're here to see Sock Puppet Pete and they, I do a matinee show I'm like damn I'm looking at the numbers I go yeah I'm going to put him here on a Tuesday or Wednesday let him sell out and I'm going to I'm going to tell all the real com comedians, hey, he fucking stunk, but they sold out. And it is a business that, and they're going to take advantage of that until it wears out. But I go, it's cool, but you should be like cultivating younger comedians or pe people you think are funny. And you should really be like, like helping them out, training them to become good headliners and good middle acts. Like, don't forget that because the majority of Comedy clubs need comedians. They need real comedians. You need real comedians. You can't cheat comedy, man. I'm telling you, no. you this. This is how I try to cheat comedy. Let me tell you how I try to cheat it. My 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 manager at the time said, "Okay, this is how fast you can be great. You're gonna go on stage a couple times a night for a good 10, 15 years. That's as fast as you can." <laughs> and he was right. That's, he's like, man, Godfrey, you're so good. Well, let me tell you how I did it. I did 30 to 40 shows a week. All of us were there. When I was, that was the time, it was me, Bill Burr, when he had hair. Mm -hmm. Bill Burr, Robert Kelly, Jim Norton, 
Keith Robinson, Colin Quinn, uh, Nick DiPaolo, when Nick was not so crazy, you know, not so right wingish because I thought Nick was one of the funniest dudes around. Steve Byrne um, was a part of that group, wasn't he? Steve Byrne, Steve Byrne, hell yeah, Byrne, me and Byrne, me with the same birthdays, man. Huh. July 21st, along with Robin Williams, John Lovitz, and George Wallace, July Whoa. 21st. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, man, just going on stage, it's like I was around. This is what we did, man. Like, this is what we did. We were on stage, and that I was like, oh, that's how you get good. Yeah. You got to do it all the time. Boxers, if, if you can compare stand up and boxing perfectly, let me show you how. People will go, oh, I can do that comedy shit. All you're doing is just up there talking. You know, you make it look so easy. That's why the disrespect is there. Sometimes boxing, even though we see the difficulty, people think you can box because you have arms. You know, <laughs> people think they can. <laughs> have you noticed when we, 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 we've we watched boxing so long, so we think if we do this, oh, we. and then when I tried to, I took some boxing lessons at Pacquiao Gym. And sat on, um, on uh, in L.A. It's the uh, wild card gym, Freddie Roach. So me and Adam Hunter, another comedian, Adam Hunter, one of my buddies, he he he's an MMA guy, a boxer. So I would go in when I lived in L.A. I would go to the wild card gym to watch Pacquiao train and a lot of great fighters train. I did it for like two years, and I would go in. I wanted to learn boxing, and I came in with the idea like I could do this. This is I've seen it on TV. You know, and boy, did I learn my lesson. I didn't know how to punch. I didn't know the technique of punching. I was, I was, my, my concept of boxing was out the window. Once I got in that ring, they were like, what, what, this is what I did. I remember I, the guy's like, you want to, we're going to do mitts. We're going to do mitts. I said, okay. So I go in and I have the, my, I have my gloves on. He turns on the little timer and I start doing Ali shit. Like I'm starting to do, I start going, he goes, what, he goes, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I said, I said, I'm, 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 you know, like I watch on TV. He goes, floating like a butterfly, singing stuff. like a bee, Freddie. Yeah, come he on. Goes, well, you're not a fucking bee. You're a fucking moth. <laughs> 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 you float, but you don't stink shit. You just stand on it. You just fly on a light bulb. He goes, listen, that stuff that you see Ali doing. Ali was a was a a, a freak of nature. He was he was six three and he fought like a lightweight. He was so talented. He said, that's not. Listen, you stand here, you stand still, you have your hands up, you move your head slightly. All that other, that's Ali. You move your head slightly, you're a heavyweight. It's it's slight movement. And put your leg, I mean, I was in martial arts at the time for a long time. But he said, you got to get your legs a little closer. It was such, and he goes, and when you punch, he goes, you got to turn your fist. So it was all these technical, and I said, my bad, forever disrespecting boxing. It's a real science. They're not just out there throwing, there's, there's counter punching. There's it's a strategy. It's really a strategy, and it's angles. And I really and it's the same thing with comedy. It's a real science. It's a mm. science of words. It's a science of inflection and timing and improvisation. It really is. And and, you, and sometimes you got to throw the same joke eight thousand times before you get the right word to to shift it to another direction. It is a real science, and if you don't learn it, it will fuck you up, and you will get knocked the fuck out. I'm glad you mentioned that because look, you get a lot of uh, a lot of respect and a lot of attention for the uh, for the imitations that you do, as you should. I mean, you're really good at those things. But one thing that well, I've I always did, loved about your COVID. comedy is your ling linguistic mastery. So to hear yeah, you talk yeah. about taking that lesson from the boxing ring and applying it on the stage, it it that makes a lot of sense for me. Just knowing uh, just knowing how your work has really evolved over the years. Yeah, I and me being a Carlinite, I call myself a Carlinite. Yep. I am serious. I seen I saw George Carlin live at the Beacon. Oh wow! Passed. I'm I'm like yeah. So I've watched I've worked for Cosby and I've watched him do stand up. I've watched Cosby do stand up even when I, I was a warm. I was a audience coordinator for the second Cosby show. That yep. was my first job out of Chicago from I'm from Chicago. So I that was my first job working at. At, in Queens at Kaufman Astoria Studios right next to Sesame Street. Can you tell me how to get? And I finally knew how to get there. And I was right next door to Sesame Street. And Cosby, I was warming up the audience. I was like, you know, showing them the, the sets and introducing the whole cast. And um, Cosby, after a while, would come out and do stand-up. 
before he gave before I started talking because mm. he challenged me. He literally, but I watched him destroy 250 people with comedic genius. At, and I'm only doing comedy three, four years to watch that mastery. I go, that's what the level I want to be at. He's been doing this shit 40 something years. I want to be that good. When I see Carlin, and Carlin is a man of words, lots of words, because you know his parents were in advertising. Yep. Carlin's parents were in advertising. They were good with words. His father was a master of words. His mother was a master of wording. And he was always into wording and definition of words. Etymology. I'm into that. So when I watch Carlin, when I watch Pryor, who was a master of, of storytelling, acting out. And so that's where I got influenced to be that at least try my best to be as best as I can to keep the bar high, you know, for myself in the way I, you know, my style, you know, everybody's different, you know, it's like you guys, I see guys like, I love watching like Mark Norman, Sam Morrill, those guys, you know, just they're cause they're such writers. They, they very, very wordy cause they're not physical dudes. They always write and always write. And I do their podcast. So we might be drunk, you know, so those are my guys. So it's a good yeah, one. I just like to see, guys that take it serious, you know, and women that take it serious, you can tell like they work, they work their shit, man, you know? Yeah. As you yeah. alluded to earlier in this conversation, the advice that Cosby gave you that you still take to you, uh, take with you to this day is to, uh, to always be writing. I heard you mention in another interview that you also got really good advice from Jerry Seinfeld. I don't think you ever detailed what that advice was. What did Jerry tell you? Okay. When he was doing that, that documentary comedian, which I was in, mm -hmm. I have a couple of scenes in there. He was, it was when he was making his comeback when Seinfeld was done and he wanted to get back to stand up. So he was hanging around us. And so he, he was like, he asked me, cause I think he had seen me on stage doing some stuff. And, um, and he asked, Hey man, oh, how long you've been doing comedy? And I was in my ninth year and I was like, you know, feeling like, yeah, nine years, about nine years, you know what I'm saying? Going on 10. <laughs> you know, and he goes, yeah, OK, that means you're a nine year old in comedy. So the years you've been uh, been in comedy is your age in comedy. You're a nine year old. He says, always remember that. I go, that made so much sense because mm. think about a nine year old compared to a five year old compared to a two year old. The speech pattern of two year olds different than a five year old. A five year old is different than a nine year old. And I go. That he's always always got wisdom. He always got clever shit. And I go, you're so mm, you're so right. And I was I was and what's great. I you remember that. Um, this is what I like about Seinfeld. You, you remember that uh, video with him, Chris Rock, and Ricky Gervais, and the N word thing came up. Yep. And Seinfeld said the coldest line. He goes, "I never think like that. I never think that. I never thought that was funny. And I never, and nor do I seek it." He, remember that? He went to him and he kind of shut all that down, even though Louis is what Louis is, because Louis has an N-word joke, which is kind of dope, you know, and I, Louis. Yeah, I think he said I think he also said the N-word in that conversation, too, didn't he? No, he said it. He says, what are you calling me? An N-word? And yeah. he goes, yep, I'm caught. But he Chris kind of initiated to yeah. come out because because he talks about things. Louis, Louis, look at his sexual deviancy. He talks about everything. Yep. We know how Louis is. You know, and Seinfeld goes, oh, no, I don't I don't see the humor in it and nor do I seek it. That was the coldest line. And it was funny is I met Seinfeld's college roommate in Boston. His first college roommate was an African-American guy who was like the dean of the music school in, at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. and, and, no, it's the, 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 the Boston music school. And my friend worked as a security guard. He was a comedian. He's a comedian. And he said, hey, you want to go to the, the, the music school, the famous music school in Boston? I said, hell yeah. And so I go there, we're hanging out, and I meet the guy who was the dean. His name is Lawrence. He was Seinfeld's first roommate in college. Mm. And we were at his house, and he, he's talking about Seinfeld. They're teenagers. And he goes, I came, I went to Seinfeld's first open mic. He had me drag me to go see his open mic. And he goes, yeah. He, Seinfeld said, hey, what did you think about my set? He goes, he goes, I don't think you're that funny, but you're going to be famous. He's kind of a flamboyant black. He goes, oh, no, you, you're not that, but you're going to be famous. So you're very <laughs> clever. But, but he was right. He was like, you're, you're not going to have me. You didn't have me cracking up, but I you I was laughing. But you're going to be famous because you're really, you're really, you got great stage presence. And he goes, 
And that made me think of when Seinfeld said what he said on that show, because mm. Seinfeld hung out with African-Americans in college first. He, this guy told me, he said, oh, no, he hung out with us. We, we were, we taught Seinfeld to have a little swag. We were the ones giving Seinfeld, like, um, he was hanging out with us. Well, if I'm not and mistaken, said, if I'm not mistaken, his first roommate when he moved to New York to pursue comedy was George Wallace, uh, wasn't it? George, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So Wallace, there's Mario Joyner. Mm. People don't know there's Mario Joyner, who was, who was on the Chappelle show a few times, who was yep. a good friend of Seinfeld. So he's been around African-Americans for years, since the 70s that have meant something to him. So for him to say that, that was like, that was pretty cool, man. I just thought that was cool, you know, of him. Very cool. All right, this this is going to be the most random line of conversation that you're ever going to have dealt with in an interview, but I promise there's a point here. So in doing a deep dive on your past, one, to find out you were from Chicago is awesome. I lived there for seven years. Uh, Really give Chicago a ton of credit with helping me to really get comfortable in my own skin as a human and as an adult. Met my now yes. wife there, had our first kid there. I will always hold that city so fondly. Wow. Uh, and cool. so to hear that you went to Lane Tech for a, a year or two, I even as a 30 year old, I, I was like, man, that Lane looks Tech. like the coolest high school to get to go to. You lived I in that town. From Lane Tech. What's that? I graduated from Lane Tech. Yeah, you graduated from Lane Tech. You uh, you lived in Uptown. Uh, your mom yes. was a, a nurse in Chicago. My wife was a, a nurse at UIC in labor and delivery for a while. Yeah, it's ah. very bizarre. But, so I set all of that up. I'm not even going to mention, well, I guess I am going to mention, you were a high school baseball shortstop. You wanted to be a baseball player or an astronaut yeah. growing up. But you end up going to Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and you actually walked onto the football team. Yeah, on a bet. And so this is the Jeff George era of Illinois football? Yeah. yeah okay, sure so was. John John Makovic was your, uh, was your head Makovic. coach. What, what position were you as a walk-on? Wide receiver. I just like, because I ran like a 4-4, so I had decent speed, and I did it on a bet. This guy named Marlon Primus, who was our safety, who was actually very talented quarterback, a very talented punter, but unfortunately, Illinois did not allow African-American quarterbacks. They told, like, they were brick, like, there were guys on my team that could throw the rock, man. They were going, and they would say, oh, we're all defensive guys. They converted us because they don't want us they don't want any black quarterbacks. The alumni, this is really sad shit. And you're looking at the progression of football now, but they literally did not want. And this guy could throw the field. He, he was 6'5", six, 6'4", six, Marlon Primus. And they didn't allow it because of race, which was really twisted. Yeah, there's a weird <laughs> amount of racism in Champaign-Urbana that Stephen Bardo ended up calling out a few years ago. And so hopefully Bardo, that's, that's my man. Hopefully that's helped to change things. Now, was Howard Griffith one of your teammates yes. at Illinois? Oh, yeah, Griffith okay. was my man. So yeah. I'm setting all of this up because one of my dear friends, he's a guy that I worked in radio with for a long time, used to be a coach at Illinois with Makovic, came with Makovic to Texas. So I'm wondering if you remember a guy by the name of Bucky Godbolt, Coach Godbolt. He was the running backs coach. Godbolt, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because we had Coach Tepper, Godbolt. We had the defensive line guy, too. Our defensive um, coach, the defensive lineman coach. I remember him. I remember, oh, I remember, um, oh, God. What was, Lundquist was the quarterback coach. Okay. Oh, and I, I remember doing, a, uh, I had, you know, all the rookies have to do a talent show. We They shave our heads, and you got to get your head shaved, or they'll chase you and find you, but you get your head shaved, and then you got to do a, uh, 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 um, uh, a talent show. So what I did was I imitated the coaches. I was imitating a few players, and this is before I knew I wanted to be a comedian. And I did um, Coach Ludquist. He was so funny because he'd be like, uh, "Yeah, you guys, you guys got to get under that helmet, so we got to bubble their snot. That's what we want to do. Want to bubble their snot? <laughs> I want to see their snot bubble. Oh, I nailed. That's exactly how he talked." And then, and it, but he was really funny because he, when you're on the field, when he's teaching court, he goes, ah, eh, you look like you were struggling there. You're struggling. You're struggling there. Yeah. Even when, even in the, in the, in the playroom, when you're, they're, they're, they're talking about like you're watching film and you're falling asleep, they go, okay, you better wake up there, Anderson. You're struggling. You're struggling. Caught you struggling. 
So I did I did the um I did the um and people were like, wow, like you really like killed it. I I was the best dude on that uh that talent show. I always could imitate people, but the fact that you guys saw that I can do voices was because of COVID. It was COVID. Exactly. I, mean, I could yeah, they were like, Wow, we didn't know you could do all that. I go, I got rejected by SNL three times. So that's that's where it's bizarre to me because the SNL tryout is all about the imitations and the characters that could, you can do. And I don't know anybody who's gonna be topping you in that regard to go uh, along with that me. sharp maybe comedic just, mind. Maybe it was me. Maybe it's just uh, chemistry wise, it wasn't a person they want they didn't want a guy like me on there. I just take it I just, you know, Daryl Hammond, who was on there for a long time, was a, fr was a friend of mine. He told me the reason why I didn't get there. He told me some reasons, and I was like, oh. He goes, I'm t I just wanted to give you some closure on the reason why. It was just some domination type of shit. Like, you know, don't want anybody. To, 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 to. It was some, some, he broke it down to me. Like, and told like, me feel, like feeling threatened? by what you some were capable like of? That. He was telling me the honest truth. He goes, because you, you were a no-brainer. You know, in my audition at SNL, I got a standing ovation at the comic strip. And um, I did five, five characters, five impersonations. I even did, and this is like 99. And I did like, I did Johnny Carson just to top it off. Mm -hmm. I did Carson. Johnny, who I, who is another hero of mine. Mm -hmm. I did Carson. I literally was like, wow, good stuff. I did not know that. I did that. And that place went like, what the f because it's a it's an african-american guy doing johnny carson that yeah. just makes it even better when you're a different race it's like frank caliendo who's become a friend of mine caliendo when he does charles barkley when he does morgan freeman sometimes your race helps the situation because it's the paradox like yo that's like you right now doing steve harvey and you nail it i go oh that looks so trippy this blonde blue-eyed guy doing steve harvey this is fantastic visually it's amazing it's like, because when I do Carson, they go, this black dude just did fucking Johnny Carson. Because when you look at it, it's just the voice thing. It's just a voice box. And a voice box can be in anybody. It's just a, a tuning of the voice box. Really, the race has nothing to do with it. But the beautiful thing about comedy is that there's visuals to it. Yeah. There's actually race does help in situations. Like, you, if you did Steve Harvey and I'm doing Johnny Carson, that would be so fucking dope. Well, you uh, another good example from your career is you you doing a version of Ben Stiller and Zoolander, which was freaking hilarious because you guys look a lot alike too. And then you obviously got the uh, the Derek Zoolander mannerisms going on too. I'm <laughs> really really sorry for what I did. Yeah, and it's almost very Trump like. This is a very good show. I'm very proud to be. Oh here. yeah, be. you're very good. You're a very good interview. I don't like some of the questions you ask. Very rude. You didn't say hello. You didn't. Say <laughs> and, and 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 me and Shane Gillis, man, we both we both go back and forth. That it. it's dope. Like Shane, who's so funny. Jesus Christ. Yeah. What a beast. Yeah. For, a for everybody dude. who uh, doesn't deserve the uh, the attention that they're getting now, he's on the other end of that coin. Where uh, that that he guy deserves, deserves the attention. It. He's, he's just great. He's dope. He's a good dude. He's like one of the guys. He's like a he's a, a ex athlete football guy. So he's yeah. just like a frat dude. He's just a frat dude that just does pranks all day in the house. You know, he's just funny. Drinks, talk shit. He's just funny guy, man. Period. That's just straight funny dude. Period. Hey, for yeah. people who are uh, maybe considering checking you out at Vulcan this weekend, two shows Friday, two shows Saturday, a show on Sunday. Is there a general yeah. theme that you're operating on right now, or what can folks expect? Stream of consciousness. Okay. Stream of I'm very conversational. Stream of consciousness. And you know, in a conversation, you can go. Sometimes you can deviate from the subject. Go there, there, there. I like that that flow. But it's going to be I'm talk about things that you know about on the planet: politics, race, maybe women, maybe uh, shit. I don't know animals. I'm talk about things that you've seen on the planet. All right, can't Get wait. My interpretation, shit, because I don't know how I'm going to feel each show. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, and I hope people show up because I've never been to this place. Uh, yeah, I, I do too. I do too. It's why we're talking right now. I want people to I've know that, that you're in town I've this never, weekend. I, I mean, one, uh, top top comedic talent on the planet. You're uh, you're at uh, a great place to see comedy. At Vulcan and Cap City is where I go mainly, but I my, I had a, a different a, a scheduling conflict and then Vulcan opened up. I said, oh, I've never been there. And I know... Austin got some weird ass spaces to do comedy in. So I was like, 
All right, I'll try. But the beautiful thing about this is that so many different clubs are opening up. Comedy's so big now. You can work all kinds of ways. You can go, some guys I know are on cruises. There's guys that do churches. They do corporates. They do, there's work everywhere. So nobody has this power over anybody's fucking performance, which I like. A lot of new clubs are opening up, which is needed. And so there's work, man. There's work. Nobody can go, oh, you can't. All right, I'm going to go over there. You know, I'm, I'm going to this club. I, I got here, you know? So that's what I like, that there's lots of opportunity for people, you know? Love to hear that. So other than the uh, all the work available, this is the last question now, Godfrey. What do you love about yes. stand-up? Whoo! Uh, freedom of talking shit, period. Regardless of the woke people trying to police it, but it ain't working. They're trying to police comedy. You, that's the last bastion of like free speech and really expressing yourself. If, when, if As long as you're within the parameters of comedy, some people will say really mean shit and go, it's comedy. I go, well, no, not really, dude. You were just being, you think it's an excuse to be a fucking dickhead. You got to have art to it. Like if you do a racial joke, it better be fucking well-crafted. You go, yeah, that was fire. That was fire. People will go, that was good. So the people who get offended by it, fuck them. But stay within the rules of comedy. That's all we're saying, bro. Like, hey, man, if you go and dunk, dunk within the rules of basketball. You, okay, that was fair. You didn't walk. You didn't travel. Two points. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's all. And uh, it's the freedom of speech. It's the freedom of expressing yourself. I think people, that's why they go, Godfrey, why do you always look, you look the same? I go, because I have no stress because I at nighttime I get to get on a mic and bomb and bomb hard. I mean, bomb as in go in hard. Yeah. And, and and just express myself and get money and good lord it's the freedom it's the freedom well and to bring this back around to those trying to cancel con uh, comedy their public enemy number one right now ironically is jerry seinfeld of all people of all the options to try and pick out to cancel in this day and age jerry is public and what, enemy number and why one. why is he why is he why is he what did he say something uh because because might... he he was willing to talk about uh the fact that um uh, what was the question that was asked? So the question was asked about there being too many white men in comedy or something, and it's all just evolved from there. And he's like, that, he that, is a ridiculous, too- that is a ridiculous question you're asking me, and I have no interest in, in, uh, in humor. Is that what he said? Thing. I, I, I am paraphrasing, and I'm doing a terrible job of it. You should look it up after this conversation, because okay, it was, said, it was a ridiculous words. question asked by the interviewer, and he wanted no business with it. And again, things have just devolved from there to where you have people walking First out when all, he's giving commencement addresses at colleges. It's it's truly absurd, but it just speaks to where we are in 2024. Are there too many white men? I, how about how many? How about about too many shitty comics in comedy? How about that? That's how about we? Where the, there's 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 many comedians. There's ra- comedians of every race now. Indian. There's a, an Indian comic every week. An Indian comic. There's international comic. To say that now, and if you say if it's white male dominated, you could say that as far as running a comedy business wise, yeah. But as far as like participation, I don't think that's like what the fuck does that mean? Why are you trapping them? Why are you trying to trap them and shit? Like we now, as far as like you think there are a lot of shitty comics now, we're talking. I don't care what race it is, because every race got trash. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Take it from me, goddammit. There's somebody right now bombing in Yugoslavia or, or in Czech going, but bombing like a motherfucker with a special. <laughs> Someone in China going, these are don't get that bombing. Boo, get the fuck out of here. Why does he got a special? Problem is, if you bomb in, uh, bomb in China and you're bombing with some uh, government jokes, that's probably going to be it for you in your stage time. At least, at least that's fair. You do a bad joke, they kill you. At least they need to bring that shit here. <laughs> You go to the lions or something, some mouse they dung type shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. man. And that's the sort of thing you can expect at Vulcan Gas Company this weekend. Godfrey's going to be there. Two shows Friday, two shows Saturday, a show on Sunday. Go to VulcanATX.com to snag those tickets. Uh, Godfrey, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today, man. Thank you so much for the time. Hopefully this isn't the last time. Oh, no, no doubt. This was fun as hell, man. Thanks a lot, dude. You're still watching or listening on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or elsewhere. Greatly appreciate you subscribing and like today's show. Leave a positive comment if you don't mind as well while you're at it. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. We'll talk to you next time on Books on Pod.